This is the Lackawanna Iron and Steelworks in Scranton, Pennsylvania. The steelworks was founded in 1838 when a man named William Henry purchased this land. Henry set up his first blast furnace here in 1841, and he would set up four others for a total of five. And what we're looking at here is the base of the blast furnace. So this stone structure would have been the base. And if you really look around, we see this, that we're actually in the valley of a brook here. So this brook is called the Roaring Brook. And there are steep cliffs on both sides of it. That was, that was done intentionally because Firstly, this brook would, would have provided power for the Iron Forge. The Iron Forge originally used a bellows to provide air for the steel production process. So a blast furnace works by basically dumping iron, coal, and other products into the blast furnace and then blowing hot air into it. So they would have used this brook here to provide power for blowers to, to provide the air for the blast furnace. Any of you who watch my video on Bethlehem Steel know that there they set up a whole series of gas-powered blowers to, to blow air into those blast furnaces. Well, here they originally used, used water power to do that. And the other advantage of this location is, if you see, we're at the base of a cliff. So, so they built these, the blast furnaces into this base of the cliff. And each of those arches consists corresponds to a blast furnace and what they would have done is they would have actually loaded the blast furnaces from the top of the cliff here so they would have taken the material the iron ore the coal loaded them into these blast furnaces at the top I'll show you the top in a minute and then they would have once the iron ore melted they would have extracted the iron ore and the byproducts the slag from the base of the furnaces at the brook level so at the level of the river and the Scranton area is actually a good location for uh, iron works because there's local coal deposits, local iron deposits, and they would have been able to source the materials for producing steel locally. And this also would eventually grow up to become a populated town to support the workforce of this iron forge. And that right there is actually a Scranton University, which would have, or University of Scranton, which, which would have been founded in this community as well. And the other thing, as, as I'll show you when I get up to the top, there's a lot of different railroad connections in, that formed in this area as well. So this is the base of one of the furnaces. And as you see, there's three others right there. And taking a look inside of it, what we see is we see that this is pretty much a hollowed out cylinder that's open at the top. And what they would have done is they would have dumped the iron and, iron and the coal in at the top and let it burn and they would have, would have extracted the the steel or the iron ore and the slag at this level here. And you can see inside this is, there's a whole catacombs of different rooms to access the different, to access the sides of this blast furnace. And just taking a look at it from another angle. So you can see the stone archways between the different blast furnaces for accessing the areas between the blast furnaces. And they would have been able to access the furnaces. The furnaces have multiple different doors to access different sides of them. And you can see how this is, is constructed of pretty much rudimentary brickwork and stonework. So rough stones being cemented together. You notice that in the back of the wall. And you also notice the back of the wall, there's some areas like that bottom right there where there's just bare rock from the cliff. And another look at the side of the furnace. So this is the row of furnaces right there. And this is the side of them. This is obviously we've been blanked off recently, but you can actually see how they would have been able to access around the back of the furnaces. 
and this here this passage goes behind the furnaces so behind all four of the furnaces and accesses the and basically exits the other side and you notice that with each of the furnaces there's another another archway in the back so with each furnace there would be four archways to at the four different sides of the jacks to access the furnace this is the top of the blast furnace and you can see looking down into it it's a hollowed out cylinder and at the that at the bottom there is the is the arch looking out at the base of it where they would have extracted the iron extracted the pig iron so one of the advantages of this if you look we look around behind us we actually see that the this is a relatively flat area so the town is at the level of the top of the blast furnace and that's advantageous because it means they wouldn't have had to haul the coal up to the coal and the iron ore up to the top of the blast furnace instead they would have been able to just to just dump it into the top so unlike for example bethlehem steel where they had a series of skiffs to lift the iron ore and the coal to the top of the blast furnace here it's no need for that because it's already at the because you just bring it to town it's already at the top level and looking around as well there's also a railroad back there which was founded after founded to service this blast furnace and you can see over in that direction those fences they're the tops of the other blast furnaces so that's one blast furnace and that's another blast furnace and that over there's a third blast furnace So just looking down into one of the other ones. In addition to William Henry, the furnace was also owned by the Scrantons, George Scranton, who was Henry's son-in-law, and his brother Selden. Their cousin Joseph Scranton also provided financial backing for the furnace and would serve as its superintendent. And the Scrantons, or at least Selden and George, as well as John Henry, have actual connections to New Jersey. And the Scrantons were originally from the Oxford area, so near where the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western's tunnel was located. I'll leave a link to that video. I have a video about that, so I'll leave a link to that video. But they operated uh, iron, they originally operated uh, iron forge in Oxford, New Jersey, before moving to Scranton and opening this iron forge and this iron forge would actually grow to be pretty large i believe by 1891 it was the third largest iron forge in the country and it was actually a pretty sizable community that, that grew up around scranton to provide workers for this forge so this forge attracted a lot of immigrant workers, Welshmen, Irishmen, Germans, and later Eastern Europeans who would have provided the workforce for this forge as well as for the iron and coal mines that service this forge. The Lackawanna Iron Works used the hot blast technique, which John Henry and the Scrantons pioneered while living in Oxford, New Jersey. This method involves blowing a blast of hot air into a blast furnace and it is more efficient than previous methods such as blister steel or crucible steel. The furnace that Henry and the Scrantons established in Oxford was likely the first successful use of the hot blast technique in the United States. They moved to Scranton, then known as Slocum's Apollo, in order to experiment with using anthracite coal, which was plentiful in the region, for steel production. Previous furnaces used charcoal or bithymous coal. This is an example of a steel railroad track which would have been constructed by the Lackawanna Iron Steelworks. And this particular example was constructed in 1889. And you can see it says, it says Scranton Steel Company on it. And 
actually that's one interesting side note the scranton steel company was actually formed by the scrantons who for a period broke away from the lackawanna iron and steel works and founded their own steel mill on the other side of the town to compete with this i believe they had a falling out with the company's management or something of that nature but they would eventually reconcile and merge the scranton steel company which was led by the scrantons with back with the Lackawanna Iron and Steel Works. But this type of steel rail was considered to be very advantageous over previous iron rails and would become some of the standard of the of steel rails, which is effectively what we're still using today as rails. One other thing of interest is that right there. So right now I'm standing on the top of the blast furnaces and that building right there actually used to be a railroad station so that used to be the delaware lackawanna and westerns passenger railroad station and we included both that main built massive building there and that that structure there which would have been the loading platform for the railroad and the railroad would have traveled on that raised concrete raised piece of concrete there so if you see that black fence with that concrete wall below it that would have been where the railroad traveled, where the passenger railroad traveled for this station. In 1872, Joseph Scranton's son, William Walker Scranton, took over the business, and he would be responsible for introducing many technological innovations. William traveled to Britain and Germany, where he learned the Bessemer process for making steel. After some initial resistance, he with the help of another industrialist named Moses Taylor, was able to convince the company to adopt the process, which they did in 1875. In 1900, Lackawanna Iron and Steel began construction of a new steel mill in West Sicana, which is a suburb of Buffalo, New York, which had better rail access than Scranton, as well as access to ports on Lake Erie and they would eventually transfer their operation to this new site. The company sold the site and Scranton to the Lackawanna and Wyoming Railroad, who scrapped much of the equipment associated with the steelworks. In 1922, the Lackawanna Steel Company was acquired by Bethlehem Steel, and Bethlehem Steel would continue operating them until their bankruptcy. 